Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this uh, exciting uh, new video series on the Quran, specifically the topic of Ahruf and Qiraat and the controversy surrounding all of this. Uh, in the last couple of episodes, myself and Dr. J. Smith have unpacked a number of issues and also we uh, listed uh, to you uh, the different angles that we are going to handle uh, this particular video series and the different topics that we are planning on unpacking. And I thought Dr. S uh, Smith, as always, uh, did an excellent job in uh, laying out the arguments. So last time we talked about the presuppositions. Uh, what I mean by that is, what is the traditional Islamic presupposition about the fact that the Quran is a book that has never changed, it's still exactly the same, that it emanated back in the seventh century and everything you read about it supports the fact that it started it at that time when in fact really we see a gab and i like to call it this silent gab where you have nothing going on for at least one can argue 200 years when it comes to the quran until you begin to see things that will be reverse engineered back to the seventh century and i'm not going to really uh you know reveal a whole lot right now because i want dr smith who is with me here in the studio uh to handle this so today we are going to talk about the preservation of the quran and the first part of that is what does the Quran actually say about its own preservation? Okay, uh, yeah. this is actually uh, very germane to what happened two and a half months ago. Remember that interview that uh, Muhammad Hijab had with Yasser Qadi? Dr. Qadi, yes. You're not going to see it on the internet anymore on their sites. They uh, until uh, tell our uh, audience why we're not going to see it anymore. They deleted it about two weeks ago. They deleted it. They both had to be deleted off both of their sites. It's become such a thorn in their sides. It's become a real conundrum. Talk about conundrum. They are in a conundrum because they should never have had that interview. And here's the, here's the, here's the problem. As Muhammad Hijab was there asking Yasser Qadi, on June 8, 2020, for those of you who are watching this years later, this happened on June 8, 2020. It was an innocent uh, interview. It took about an hour and 45 minutes long. It's the last 25 minutes where all the damage was done. And Muhammad Hijab was asking a very good question. And it was a question that he was forced to ask because of what happened back in 2016. Four years ago, Hatun Tosh and I went down with our team and we held up 26 different Qurans, including the seven that you see right here, including the eight that you see right here. Right. These eight that you see on this table here. We didn't hold up these very ones. We, hold, we held up ones that Hatun had, uh, and we just held them up for the whole crowd to see. Now that's the first time we'd know anybody had ever done that publicly. We filmed it, and then when you film things like that, that goes up on the internet. And so what was fascinating is, if you look at the film that we put up, that was in 2016, I think it was June of 2016, but about two months ago, I put the film up again on Fander Films. So you can see it on Fander Films. As we were holding them up, Muslims started to confront us and they were throwing things at us. They tried to grab the papers out of our hands as we, as we were impacting and looking at different, uh, different examples of these different uh, uh, vari variants. Over to the right, or depending on when you're looking, over to our left was a tall man, Muhammad Hijab. Six foot six. You can't, you can't help but see him because he's so tall. When he and I argue, I'm on the ladder and my face is equal to his because he's so high. And he was over there and you could see he was having problems with this. And so about a half an hour into our talk, he s goes to the side and he tells all the Muslims to leave. You can see him on the film. You can see him. He's on film there telling them all the Muslims to leave. Don't stay here. Don't stay here. Don't see this. Don't look at this. Do not mm. listen to what they're saying. Do not watch what they're doing. He was going through a, cri a crisis of faith at that time. Now, I didn't know this. I just thought he just didn't, he wanted to get the Muslims out. And he did. He pulled all the Muslims out. That happened in June of 2016. We're now in June of 2020. And he comes to you. What Yasef a coincidence. Kadi, four years later, almost to the day. Yeah. And he asks the same question that he should have asked back then. He should have stayed and listened to us. He should have let us walk him through it because he would have he, he would not have wasted four years. And listen, I mean, uh, the interview was really well done. I mean, you can ask these kind of questions in a normal setting. There's nothing wrong with asking questions like, and I don't think even there was anything wrong with the way Yasser Qadi even handled 
the answer. Except what did he say? Almost immediately when he asked him, what about this gira? What, uh, what about these different variants, these ahruf? Now, gira, can you define what gira and ahruf are as an Arabist? There is so many opinions out there, Dr. J. I mean, uh, it's, it's, here's, the, here's the way you think about it. Uh, where did this idea of seven ahruf came about? Well, supposedly, supposedly, uh, the uh, prophet of Islam uh, was, I want to say, forced to explain why Omar heard someone from his own tribe reciting a certain passage in the Quran different than what Omar himself used to recite. So he grabs the guy after the prayer, takes him to Muhammad, probably with the expectation that Muhammad is going to rebuke this guy or call him a heretic. Well, to Omar's surprise, uh, uh, you know, the, the Prophet of Islam actually endorsed the reading and said, oh, that's how it was also revealed to me. So this is a different dialect. That's this right. This is a different pronunciation. Except both of them are from the same tribe. I know. That's the problem. Okay. And then you have another tradition of the same thing. This time, Obay ibn Kaab is the one who was troubled by it to the point that Muhammad even questioned if your faith is troubled because of what I just said and rebuked him for it. Okay, we're gonna get into all these all right. different dialects because we're gonna talk right. about seven of them, but let's just get back to it. Basically, the definition is would be a pronunciation or a, a recitation or a dialect. Those are the three I've always heard. Uh, are you willing to go with that as an Arabist? Sometimes you have to. Okay. Now, can I've you always see? grown up believing that there is a separation between Ahruf and Qara'at, and sometimes it's one and the same. And in fact, I think it's Sayuti who has like 40 different opinions on it. Okay, are you finding, are you listening to him? This is an Arabist who doesn't even know how to define it. And this is the problem almost every Muslim I've heard who's tried to define what a Ahruf is and I, what I'm a I'm bringing my Islamic background into this. I'm, they I'm don't know. You. Yes, Qadi didn't yeah. know. And this is fascinating. But nonetheless, there was Muhammad Ijab. He was there in the crowd. He's pulling away all these, these people from listening to this four years later, he puts his hand out. He says, what are you going to write here? He not, didn't do it just once. He did it twice. And Yasser Qadi's reaction was, we don't talk about this. This is something you don't this bring out in public. public. He says, yeah. This is not for public yeah. consumption. And I thought it was fascinating. He gave three different distinctions of three different students. An introductory student, somebody who's just come to Islam, we don't even mention it. An intermediate student, we just ask them to memorize it. And there's a red line beyond which you just don't go. We have a respect for the Quran. Remember he said that? We have a respect. We just don't go beyond this red line. And then for the... Uh, the expert students, the ones who take his class. He said, how many times? Take my class and I'll explain to you. You do a deep dive. Right. And that's when all the problems start, he said. That's when all the problems start, when you do a deep dive. And I was just sitting there clapping. I said, exactly. That's what caused you a crisis of knowledge. Because remember, Muhammad Hijab and asked him, what about this crisis of knowledge you had way back in Yale University in 1995, 25 years ago? Did it, ch did it change your faith? No, it was not a crisis of faith. It was a crisis of knowledge. What a distinction he was making. Why? Because what did he say right after that? I have absolute, uh, I have absolute uh, belief that the Quran is the word of God. There is no difference between the Quran I have today. It has been preserved. It has been guarded. He went into a mantra. This is a mantra that he went into. That's the crisis of faith that he didn't want to admit. Because you don't, you cannot admit that on camera that you have a crisis of faith. Crisis of knowledge, yes, but not a crisis of faith. You see the distinction he was making. Now, do we say that with the Bible? Have we, have you, have anybody, this idea that we don't ask this question, we don't go beyond this question, and now he was at Yale University, there is no red line there. You can ask any question you want at Yale University. That, exactly, and, and what we say about the Bible is it is the inspired word of God, but we have no problem stating that God shows different people, different writing style, different cultural backgrounds to write his word. We have no problem saying we discovered earlier manuscripts and now we have to put in the text critic a footnote to tell you earlier manuscript have this word or maybe have this phrase we have no issue with these things in fact wasn't wouldn't you say that textual criticism historical criticism source criticism redacted criticism has though it was birthed on other books it came into its maturity on the bible it was the bible that has had the textual historical redacted source higher and lower criticisms all these literary criticism have all been applied to the bible and in every case the bible has come out on top amen so for 200 years they've been attacking the bible in all these areas and i remember when i was studying under dr gerald hunting there in 
19, uh, boy, I'm showing my age now, 1993, 1994. I was studying there at Su School of Oriental African Study. I was in his class, and the very introductory course, the very introductory class, he said, I spent 20 years using historical criticism against the Bible. After 20 years, I finally gave up because we just were not finding anything. We just could not find it, but I had all the tools. So I started moving, and we had all the languages because it's much the same languages, the same, uh, the same Middle Eastern languages that we use, and I just applied it to the Quran. And for the last, what, 20 to 25 years now, we have just found thing after absolute, one thing after problem, and we're, that's what we're gonna study in class. And for the whole year that I sat there taking copious notes, listening to what he was finding out, quoting from Dr. Patricia Crone and quoting from Dr. John Wansborough, these great scholars, as to using, of what they have found using the same critical analysis that was applied to the Bible, he was now applying it to the Quran and to Muhammad and to the right. what we know as the emergence of right. Islam. That was in 1994, 1995. So we're talking about 25 years ago. I've been working with this material, and this is what's fascinating. Now you see Muhammad Hijab asking this question of Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi is from the West. He's over here in the West. He's here in Houston. He grew up here. He was at Yale University, which is a product of historical criticism. Yale University, there is no red line. You can ask any question you want. And he had never heard these questions being asked. In his, he said, in my freshman year, I was coming across things I never heard of before. That there was not just one Quran, there were actually a multiplicity of Quran. There's not just one reading, there was only right. about 30 readings. And he heard that there was even more than 30. We're gonna get into that later on, that there's even more than 30. But nonetheless, he was getting this there in 1995, 25 years ago. And so, Muhammad had jobs, okay, so which one is it? Which one is it? That, I'm going to give you a blank piece of paper. Which one of these 30? Is it going to be Hafs? Is it going to be Warsh? Is it going to be Kalut? Is it going to be Nafi? Is it going to see, be Ibn Kathir? See, the very question by Hijab indicates that he's not buying the idea they're all the same. And what did Jastakadi says? It's not that easy. It's not a yes or no. He said it should be a yes or no. Which one is it? Right. He would not answer for 25 minutes. He didn't answer until the very end. He finally gave an answer. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. We're going to get to that in another episode to keep you people so you can come back to whet your appetites because it's fascinating the answer he finally concluded with. But we hold on a minute. We're going to get to that answer. So but, what is the Islamic, uh, the Quranic view about preservation? Here it is. And this is why Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab have no wiggle room. They cannot wiggle out of this. They cannot go right or left. They, and remember he did say that, you know, we're, the, the experts today in the West are much great. They know an awful lot more than they did 100 years ago. They know an awful lot more and they're looking at us like as if we are the emperor with no clothes. What a thing to say. What a thing to admit. That, that's right, he did use that uh, metaphor. What a category he was, and the, uh, what, what an admission he was making. We are looking at them with that emperor with no clothes close because what he cannot go beyond is what the Quran says and there's there are five things that every Muslim has to agree upon when it comes to the Quran I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and put them up on the screen number one the Quran is uncreated and exists eternally on clay tablets in heaven now you, Al Fadi, you know that this is internal to the Quran itself. I've said it right there. It's in chapter 85, verse 22, Surah 85, Ayah 22. It's very clear that these are known as the preserved tablets. What do we mean by preserved? You need to go to the exegetes. You need to go to the tafsir. And in every case, the exegetes are very clear that this means eternally preserved, that this is the uncreated Quran. And that's why Muslims have always said that. They have no other choice but to say that because of chapter 85, verse 22. Now, the second thing they claim right. is that it was sent down to Muhammad over a period of 22, some say 23 years, between 610 and 632. So sent down to one man in that 22 to 23 year period, but not written down. It had not been written down in any codex or any book form. Right, and this is where the issue of, was it sent down in a seven ahruf? Was it sent down in one? Apparently, according to Muhammad, it was sent down to him in seven ahruf, which to my surprise, Omar didn't even know that. Okay, we're gonna to get to that yeah. in another episode because that's hugely significant. And right. that that reference comes from Sahih Buhari, Al-Buhari, uh, volume number six, book number 61, hadith number 509. And it's very clear, and that's where Muslims have to go to to find out how the Quran was actually written down, when it was finally written down during the time of Abu Bakr between 632 and 634. So number three is that the Quran was completed 20 years later in its final form in 652. That we get from Al-Buhari, volume six, hadith number uh, 510, but it'd be book number 61, hadith number 510. And then number four, that since that time, from since 652, the Quran has never changed. 
the Quran has never changed. Uh, and that's we're going to get from two other verses that I'm going to look at next. And number five, that the Quran is guarded. The reason it's never been changed by human, because God guards it. Let's go to the next yeah. slide. I want to just make one comment, if you don't mind, from my own uh, studies about the idea that Uthman's Quran was the complete or canonized one. Uh, there are some scholars out there that will tell you Uthman picked the cream of the crop, literally that the best readings and eclectic readings of the Sahaba and decided on which reading it's going to be. Now, when I read this, I said, if I was a Muslim still, and I read something like that, that's going to trouble me big time because I've always thought it is the exact same Quran that was revealed, but yet it's telling me here that he only chose which readings and compiled it eclectically and made it the standard. Where's the source for that? Well, I mean, you have one Islamic scholar who wrote something about that, like uh, Sadiqi, for instance. Um, when did he live? Uh, well, he lived now. Okay, yeah. where's the source that he's going to? Uh, he's going, of course, to uh, Islamic sources. You cannot go to that a source for the 21st century. You've got to go back to yeah. Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari would yeah. shut that down very clearly, and that's yeah. why I'm putting it down there. So if anybody comes up with that, go right back to Al-Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 510, and 509 and 510, because that shuts that argument down real quickly. Because what does Uthman say to Zaid ibn Thabit? I'm giving you three others to help you, hadith Ibn uh, uh, Zubair and Alas, those four, the four of you are to write it in the Qurayshi dialect. That's right. That's the what Qureshi the tradition dialect. says in Bukhari. So you can, so Siddiqui can say all he wants in the 21st century, but I'm not, I don't care about the 21st century. I want to see what the earliest, remember our historical critique, our, our textual criticism always goes back to the earliest. We, in the last episode, we, we made that rule. You always go back to that which is closest to the original. And the closest to the original is Al-Bukhari, not Siddiqui. We go back to Al-Bukhari and that shuts that dark argument down so quick. That's why it's so good that we have these to use them. We're holding but Muslims saying, accountable to their own traditions. Even an argument like Sadiqa's argument, it's still troubling to the traditional view. You're telling me Uthman is the one who decided which readings should be the best? Well, actually, you're starting to intimate what Yasser Qadi came to. Hold on a minute, because yeah. now you're jumping the gun. Because Yasser no, no, Qadi, no, I, I brought it up because I know you're going to bring up something about Yasser Qadi, who talked about something later, also. Yasser Qadi fashion. actually agrees with Siddiqui on this point, and that's yeah. why it's laughable because yeah. Yasser Qadi was forced to do this because of Muhammad Hijab two and a half months yeah. ago. Yeah. So let's go to, and I want to show you this next slide here because here is the reference to that the idea that the Quran cannot be changed and that God guards it. And there you see right there in Shurat Ayah 10 verse 15, which says, And when our clear verses are recited unto them, those who hope not for their meeting with us say, Bring us a Quran other than this, or change it. Say, and this is referring to O Muhammad, It is not for me to change it on my own accord. I only follow that which is revealed unto me. Verily, I fear if I were to disobey my Lord, the torment of the great day, and that means the day of resurrection. So if he were to change it, he would be, he would go to torment. Now, in chapter 18, verse 27, it, again, this idea of not changeability is also uh, recounted. And it says, and recite what has been revealed to you, in this case, this is O Muhammad again, of the book, that's referring to the Quran, of your Lord. None can change his words, and none will you find as a refuge other than him. So there it's very clear from chapter 10, verse 15, and chapter 18, verse 27, that no human intervention, no human can change it. Why? Go to chapter 15, verse 9. And the reason why is because verily we, it is we who have sent down the dukkah, which is another reference to the Quran. That's right. And surely we will guard it from corruption. And this is the most famous go-to pretext Muslims use to support the preservation of the Quran. They're, so they're, they have no other choice but to support yeah. the Quran, but to support the preservation. Can you then see the difficulty that Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab have? They've got to support this. They've got, they, there's no other way that they can get away from it. They cannot go beyond what the Quran says. So I don't blame these guys for being in a conundrum. This conundrum is a real conundrum because it's not of their doing. It's actually of the Quran's doing. The fact that it is eternal, chapter 85, verse 22. The fact that it cannot be changed, chapter 10, verse 15, and chapter 18, verse 27. The fact that God himself guards it from changing, that nobody can corrupt it, in chapter 15, verse 9, proves to me that it's the Quran that's the problem here. It is making these injunctions, which all Muslims today then have to hold to and to have to support. And therefore, can you then understand the conundrum they're in? Of course I do. And uh, next time we are going to talk now about the 
what do modern Islamic scholars also say concerning the preservation of the Quran? Thank you, Dr. J, of course, for this wonderful information. And I hope everyone is starting to catch on and what's going on here and you see how exciting this uh, series is going to be. Until we meet again next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International. Also click on the bell so that you can receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or we go live. And I would like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking on the link right below. And that way you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you on how you can give to our channel. So thank you from the bottom of my heart.